So have you had that moment whenever you're telling your friend about something strange has been, I don't know, maybe a strange craving you have, or a strange hobby, or maybe a, a weird routine you have, or a weird pain, or a symptom that you're having, and then they actually find, say, oh yeah, I do that too. Or, I have that same thing going on. You're like, oh, well I'm not the only one then. Or maybe that's comforting sometimes when you think something's wrong with you and then you're like, oh, that happens to you too? Whew. Okay, I thought I was the only one. It's kind of comforting to know you're not the only one. And there's other times knowing that you're not the only one actually helps you get through hard seasons too. We all have different uh, seasons in our life that I know while Sandy and I were beginning to date and we had our long distance relationship, she was down in Mississippi and I was in Boulder Lake, Missouri, and uh, for the first year of our dating relationship, we were 12 hours away from each other. That next year, she decided to move up to Chicago, which thankfully brought it down to half the trip, six and a half hours. Uh, so that was nice, but we were still distant. And it was hard knowing that we weren't close enough to just go visit. Like we had to plan our time to make sure that we could even make that trip happen. While we had friends on campus that got to see each other every day. Be next to each other and it's like, damn, that was hard. But for me, knowing that I wasn't alone helped. I know we have family and we have friends who are in military service. And some of them are dating. Some of them have their own families and their own spouses back at home. And I kept thinking over and over again, wow. I can't imagine what they do. How, how they continue to be distant like that and yet knowing their relationship is so close and working hard on that. But like that's got to be hard on them too, being so distant from each other. So keeping that in mind was okay. <laughs> knowing I wasn't alone in having a distant relationship. So sometimes it helps to be in those kinds of situations. But maybe there's other times when you realize pretty quickly that you may be the only one in the midst of the conversation you're having. That's a Christian. Why? Well, because everybody else in the conversation keeps maybe bashing or openly opposing Christians or Christianity, and you're like, I think I'm the only one here. So you may feel a little alone. Maybe you feel like Elijah being alone in the cave when after everybody else seems to be turning to Baal to worship him, you see in the cave like, God, am I the only one left? No one else is being faithful to you. I am alone. God's like, ah, there's 7,000 other people you're not aware of right now who have not bowed their knees to Baal. You are not alone. You may feel it at times, but you are not alone alone. It's hard in those kind of moments because I'm not believe that. Maybe it's kind of hard to uh, remember that you're not actually alone. But there are other people in similar situations. At camp this past year, one of the campers had shared uh, throughout his entire life he's had hmm, can't remember which one he has right now, but he always has trouble walking. And it, it's always made him feel different and sometimes isolated from other people. And he had shared that he's not the only one, though, like that. And what he loved about camp this year was being different. He said, even though each of us are different from the world, together, we realize we're different together. Even though each of us are different, we realize that we are different together. And when you are different, you realize you are not alone. So we may be feeling different from other people around us, but you're not alone. And it's honestly a benefit getting to see other people that are doing similar things to you. It's kind of nice when you are in those conversations and you realize, I know I'm not the only Christian here. Because I know that other person here is also a Christian. Whether it's at school, or whether it is in your cubicle, at work, or wherever it's at. But I also want to share that I'm not asking any single one of you in the past several conversations and sermons to disciple by yourself. You're not the only one discipling anybody here. Like, we're discipling together. Being united. When you disciple, you're not discipling alone. You are discipling 
while other people are also disciples. So we gather together as disciple makers of Jesus, realizing that if you're following Jesus, you're already a disciple of Jesus. And he's asked his disciples to make disciples. So if anything else, realizing as we come together, that as we're gathering together, we realize that we are discipling communally together. As we come together, we are disciple makers coming together, disciples of Jesus, members of Christ. And this is going to be just leading into our conversation of members, membership. What does it even mean to be a member of Jesus? So today is mainly an introduction. We realize that it's not only nice to know you're not alone, but to see that you're not alone. It's nice to look around here and be like, these are my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. All at a different workplace, all at different homes and different families and where I'm at, knowing that they're raising kids and grandchildren. Also, alongside me, and I'm not the only one doing this by myself. So as fellow disciples of Jesus, it's nice to know you're not alone, but it's better when we get to see and interact together. Knowing how people are Asking them how they're doing, how they are also making disciples of Jesus throughout their weeks. So as we come together, we get to interact, we talk, we catch up, we encourage, we pray together. And this still didn't work. Oh, now it's too much. I mean, some of the questions of when we get to gather here that you guys can be asking is like, how has your past couple weeks been going? past couple months, past couple years as you've been discipling people? How can you be praying for them and the people that they are discipling? How can they be praying for you and the people you are discipling? This is a communal thing together, working together, encouraging, praying for one another. So we are disciples of Jesus. That's follow me. If you follow me, you're a disciple of this. We're members of his body here on earth. Jesus' body visibly seen on her. So, without getting into too many details of what's coming up, I wanted to at least get us thinking about this series that we're heading into for with membership. So, I hope that some of these questions coming up will maybe spark some of your guys' personal studies or conversations with each other on the topic of membership and members of Christ. So let's consider some of these. We're not answering any of these today. I just want you guys to be thinking about some of these answers. To be thinking about what it is when you look through scripture. What do you see? I'll give you guys some passages that you guys can at least have as starting points. But what does it mean to be a member? What are we a member of? There's so many different types of membership, right? Netflix, Hulu, Discovery Plus. What kind of membership are we talking about here? Membership is such a word that is used in every place around us. You're a member of the Y, a member of the gym, a member of the school council. There's a lot of different types of membership. So what are we a member of? What do you think it means to be a member of the church or a local church? Is there a reason for being a member? Why would you be a member? What do members do? How do we interact with other members? How do we treat the body that we are members of? <coughs> Is our view of membership today similar or different from the first century churches? And in which ways? And there's plenty more. This is just to be smart. I would like for you to be able to write some of these passages down. That again would be spots to at least maybe help guide your answers in the spark. Ephesians to see the unity. 
after such divisiveness is taking place, especially for the Church of Corinth. They're in a lot of dysfunction. A lot of arguments taking place. A lot of disunity happening. Having to work through that. What does that mean? But as for today, we'll share those on Facebook so you guys can have that list as well. But I would love for us to go ahead and turn to Romans 12 to get started today.
Vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. So if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For in, in so doing, you'll be heaping fiery coals on his head. Please do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. How does that sound? That's what does that want to do? Now, did Paul tell them this because they were doing it perfectly? <laughs> that was quick though. But yeah, that's so right. He was telling them this because this is what it ought to look like. Please do this. I know you guys aren't perfect at this. But this is a goal. As a fellow brothers and sisters. The body of Christ. Honestly, thankfully, all of that can be summed up by this. Love your neighbor as yourself. Right? In the next chapter in Romans, chapter 13, verse 8 through 10, he basically repeats himself in some ways, but he says, Do not owe anyone anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Because honestly, the commands do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and any other commandment are summed up by this commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to the neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. In Galatians, he basically says the same. For the whole law is fulfilled in one statement. Love your neighbor as yourself. Romans 12 can be quite much, can't it? But it's also a great way to, for us to be looking at it and saying, oh, yeah. I didn't even consider that spot. How can we be doing that and loving each other in that way? So, maybe this is a way to help us love each other better. Maybe reading Romans 12 again and again will help us to even say, what does it mean to be a member? of the church, to be a member of Christ. One other spot I want us to look in terms of Ephesians 4. You turn to the right several pages and come across Ephesians after the big books of Corinth, or Corinthians, Corinthians, Galatians, and Ephesians. But Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 1. This is while Paul was in prison, writing to the church in Ephesus. Therefore, I, the prisoner of the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling you have received, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Because there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope at your calling. That being one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in all. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. You jump down to verse 11, he continues, saying, And he himself gave some to the apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints through the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with the stature measured by Christ for us. Then, we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and techniques of deceit. Rather, speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting way, promotes the growth of the body, for building up itself in love, by the proper working of each individual part. I hope 
And honestly, I love getting to read and seeing what it looked like. The church that was gathered together or how it was meant to be. But I hope that as we start this conversation of being a member of Christ, being a member of the local body, of the church, all together, what does that look like? What does it mean? And what, what do we as members do? How are we called to live together? Again, they didn't do it perfectly. That's why Paul was writing these letters to them. Trying to write, correct, equip, encourage these members who are gathered together as a body of Christ. But I hope we can come to this view together. We need to work through it and have that kind of life here at Eugene in our surrounding communities, our neighborhoods, workplaces, your, each household. What does it look like to be a member of Christ forever for that? And then what does it mean to be gathered together as the body of Christ? So I hope today can at least spark some of your personal studies and conversations on this topic of membership and members of Christ. Looking through those verses that you guys wrote down, um, getting to share that time together, because I hope that this is a conversation we can have meaningfully together. Let's pray.